Hello and welcome to another episode of A Question of Law. This is City TV's legal education program and here we seek to break down the law as far as it concerns our daily lives, the things we hear in the news and the things that pertain to your daily activities. This show is interactive so we do want to hear from you. Use the hashtag A Question of Law on all social media platforms. The WhatsApp line is 0550585832. What are our questions you may have throughout the show? Just send them. Send us a WhatsApp message and we'll take it right here. Now, my guests are seated. I'm going to introduce them after this short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, my guests are in studio already, and I have with me uh, Salom Adonu, who is a private legal practitioner, and also Clement Kujuakapam, who is also a private legal practitioner, as well as a senior law lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Gimpa. Gentlemen, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. It's good to have you here. Good to see you. Now, the Supreme Court has just ruled on something very interesting. And um, let me just delve into the story. We have it on uh, citynewsroom.com. Uh, something we've talked about in the past uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, this is a very interesting update that we have for you. So, the deputy speakers can vote while presiding in Parliament. Supreme Court rules. You can go to citynewsroom.com to read that story. Now, the Supreme Court has ruled that a deputy speaker of Parliament or any other member of the legislature presiding over business of the House does not lose his or her right to vote whilst presiding. Such a speaker or member can also be counted as part of the quorum for decision-making in the House under the Article 1041 of the 1992 Constitution. The court uh, consequently struck down Order 1093 um, of the Standing Orders of, the, of Parliament, describing it as unconstitutional. The order provides that a, a deputy speaker or any other member of parliament presiding over the business of the house shall not retain his or her original vote while presiding. Instructively, the Supreme Court has upheld deputy speaker Joseph Osei Wusu's decision to count himself as forming quorum in the lead up to the controversial approval of the government's 2022 budget. The landmark judgment was given in a case brought by a law professor, Justice Abdullah, contesting the Deputy Speaker's decision to count himself as forming quorum for a vote on the budget. His application for the uh, constitutional interpretation, uh, Justice Abdullah asked, among other things, that upon a, and I quote, upon a, a true and proper interpretation of Articles 102 and 1041 of the 1992 uh, Constitution, a Speaker or any other person uh, presiding over Parliament cannot be said to be part of the members present uh, for the purposes of decision-making. Upon a true and proper interpretation of Articles 102 and 1041, the, the, the first and second deputy speakers, when presiding over parliament, um, have the same authority as a speaker of parliament and can therefore not be counted as MPs present for the purposes of, of making a decision in accordance with Article 1041 of the Constitution. All right, gentlemen, let's get into this right away. We sat here a few weeks ago and, you know, tried to go back and forth on this a bit. And I think you mentioned that um, we really needed to uh, get down to brass tacks and say, let the Supreme Court take a decision on this. And it looks like they have. Yes. I mean, How big a deal is this? Oh, for me, it's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal because um, it, it helps to clarify the provisions in Article 102 mm. and Article 104. Okay. I, I think that the, there were two, 
two schools mainly, those who are saying that a deputy speaker presiding cannot be counted for the purposes mm. of quorum and does not have the right to vote. Mm. And there was the other school that, um, but clearly what the Supreme Court has done is to put this matter to rest yeah. and even giving directions that the standing orders of parliament must align. Yeah. And I think that that's very important mm. because we've had um, this 137, 138 parliament yeah. has given us enough issues that I think this is one of the issues that will help bring some order in the proceedings mm. in parliament. Now, mm. let's, let's look at the two articles at play here. And okay. I clearly belong to the school holding the view that a deputy speaker is not an ordinary speaker. Mm. He's a member speaker. A member, you said so. And yeah. he's wearing two hats mm. and has all the rights of a member yeah. and has all the rights of a speaker. Yeah. Now listen to what 102 say um, specifically. It says, on quorum, and the marginal note will say quorum in parliament. Okay. A quorum of parliament apart from the person presiding shall be one third of all the members of parliament. Mm. Okay. Two things, two phrases I am underlining for the purposes of this argument. Apart from the person presiding. Mm. And it says one third of all the members of parliament. Okay. Meaning that there's a fixed quorum. Now, if you look at the provisions of the constitution and how it's drafted in 102, the person that will preside ordinarily will be the speaker qua speaker, the speaker properly so-called. Okay. So then it means that that person cannot be counted for the purpose of quorum. Mm. Because if we don't read it like that, then what it means is that we are not going to have a fixed number for quorum. Okay. Meaning that when it comes to the part, all the members of parliament, it means that when a deputy speaker is presiding, mm. he's no longer a member of parliament. Yeah. So now, now the number will reduce by one. Mm. So your quorum of one third yes. will be on the number of members of parliament minus one. Mm. Yes. But that is not the intent of the constitution. Okay. So clearly here, when you look at 102 and we speak presiding, the intent of the framers was the speaker of parliament, properly so-called mm. elected speaker of parliament okay. presiding. If you go to 104 and you read Article 104, it brings out the meaning that 102 seeks to, seeks to portray. And okay. 104, it will say, except as otherwise provided in this constitution, mm. matters in parliament shall be determined by the vote of the majority of members present and voting. Mm -hmm. Members okay. present and voting. Okay. A deputy speaker who is a member of parliament, when presiding, he's, is he present in parliament? He is there. Okay. So my position, even before mm. the Supreme Court decision, was that, yes, the, the one presiding as a member can be counted for the purposes of quorum or voting. Mm. But when it comes to exercising his right to vote based on his own principles, can decide that for transparency and fair play, because yeah. I'm the referee here, yeah. even though I have the right, mm. I will not exercise it. There mm. are some electoral commissioners who have decided that on voting day, they, they will, will not vote. vote yeah. But it doesn't mean that the electoral commissioner does not have a vote. Okay. So the point being made here, if you read 104 clearly, together with 102, is that the deputy speaker is a member speaker. And a member speaker is there to represent his constituents. Yeah. And if there's a matter of interest, he must have that. So you can't take that right from him. Yeah. Because he has assumed the office of uh, presiding mm. or moderator mm. for, for that yeah, session. I mean, for, me, for me, there's the, the aspect of it that was, was interesting, as we couldn't see that the deputy should still remain have his capacity to vote was the fact that if he loses his capacity to vote then he's no longer representing his people on in that in that vote his his people not he 
has been disenfranchised, but his people right. have been disenfranchised with no representation in parliament at the time of the vote. We don't have a problem saying that the speaker should not vote. Yeah. Because the speaker is not a member of parliament. Yeah. He has no constituency. Yeah. But you cannot take the right to vote mm. away from a member of parliament mm. or treat the right in such that at the point you have it, at the, the point you don't have it. Yeah. No. Mm. That is not then that yeah. is not proper. Yeah. Then that the law is not supposed to be like give you a right at the point in time, say at yeah, another point in time you don't right. you don't yeah. have it. So clearly I think that this matter um aside the the politics surrounding it, what the Supreme Court has done is to give a right mm. or affirm the existence of the right. Yeah to vote of a member of parliament, mm. one, two, and a member of parliament presiding a speaker having, not losing any of those rights okay. of the member of parliament. Okay. So, yeah, yes, quite an interesting uh, decision. I think we've discussed this many times, uh, a few times here, actually. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll get to the meat of it. Uh, the, the, what, what the Supreme Court has sought to do uh, of course, is to interpret the law, which is its original jurisdiction. But it has also done what we call judicial review. Uh, that is looking at laws which are not in consonance or which are not consistent with the Constitution and striking those laws out. Indeed, Article 2.1 says that any law which is not consistent with the Constitution, yeah. to the extent of the inconsistency, shall be null and void. So, as Clement said, uh, standing order 1083, which has to do with the deputy speakers not having the right to vote, you know, has been determined to be inconsistent with the constitutional provisions 102, 104. And to the extent of that inconsistency, mm. the Supreme Court has declared that provision of the standing orders null and void. So that's a, that's a very important thing we, we have to take note of. Of course, the, the decision has just come, and we are here to see the full reasons given by the court. I, I'm really eager to read the decisions of, 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 the, of the law lords uh, and, and how, they, they are, they, how they arrived at the decision. Mm. I, I wanted to know exactly what the nuances of the decision is. So, for example, we said here before that uh, if there is a voice vote, you know, if there is a voice vote in parliament, the job of the umpire or the speaker member speaker in this case as a deputy speaker yeah is to listen to the voices or the voice votes and determine where it tilts mm. that is why we're able to say that okay the the eyes have it or the nose have it yeah right. so in this case what becomes the job of the or what becomes the the position of the speaker because the speaker will he also be joined or will he also be in the voice vote so that's no, one let's let's just stay on the on the okay. vote so okay. what what Selom is is saying is the confusion that we bring to this matter sometimes. Having a right to vote is different from voting. Okay. If we do that division, we'll not see any problem with the um, decision arrived by the Supreme Court in any way. But you if can I have, have a right, the right to vote. You have a right to vote. And I decide to exercise that right. So yes. let's assume that. I have the right to vote, and at okay. all times I will exercise that right. No, so why, so why are we assuming? Why are we not assuming that you have a right to vote, and whether or not you exercise it is a different thing. Okay. If we, if we, than saying that you have a right to vote, and every time they are going you to exercise that right, exercise. because there are times when even they have indicated that on this matter they are not voting. Yeah. Yes, of course. There are members of parliament said on this matter I am abstaining. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you don't have the right to vote. Okay. The question is. Do you have the right to vote? Okay. It's different from when you vote. Mm. How should we view your vote? Yeah. And it's that mechanics that we are now going into. But I don't think that the, the, this is what this decision is about. This decision is clearly about do they have the right to vote? Otherwise, Salom, if we do that, we are going to say that because he is the emperor in the matter and he's going to listen to a voice vote, yeah. he can listen to the voice vote and say the eyes have it or the nays have it. Mm without us knowing whether he voted or he didn't vote. This becomes more important when there's a vote of count. Mm -hmm. 
when is the vote of numbers yeah that is where this becomes important mm. yes so I, I i was getting to that so yes so the decision has been made like i said it will be interesting to see the, the, the details the details or mm. the reasons as, as we call it so yes the decision has been made. i'm talking about the nuances so the decision being as clement as spouse solid there's no problem with that but we've moved beyond that and i'm saying that i'll be interested to see how the court dealt with the nuances so the matter of the voice that i spoke about we've seen in recent times, you know, this particular provision being employed a lot. After the voice vote, somebody rises and says, it, the vote wasn't clear, mm. so let's call for a division. Mm -hmm. So in cases where we call for division, yes. it means there's going to be a head count. Yeah. And it is the voice vote that will have to be validated. So in this case, the speaker or the member speaker, or the deputy speaker in this case, wouldn't have taken part of the vote or did not take part in the voice vote mm. but okay. he has a right to vote okay. i don't know how he would have exercised that right in the voice vote i don't know how that would be we, we wait to see how that would, that would play out in the case of a member calling for division which requires that everybody moves moving out which requires everybody moving out and being head counted whilst they walk through the door how would he be part of that validation process okay. because in the first place he was not part of the voice vote that is being validated. Yeah. So, won't it amount to something else that will mm. bring us to another place? Because you didn't vote in the first instance. When it comes to the validation, why are you voting? Yeah. These are the nuances I wanted to see how the Supreme Court, you know, mm. would deal with. Maybe it was dealt with. Maybe that will come in the detailed, you know, reasoning of the court. You know. So that said, I I, I think generally. The parliament we have today, the, the so-called hang parliament, 137, 1371 or 137138, is giving us a lot to chew on and deepening the, 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 the constitutional jurisprudence yeah. of this country, which, which in my view is a good thing. The role of the judiciary is that if there's a stalemate, the judiciary breaks that. So we have seen in this case that that stalemate to I mean has been broken. Yeah. And and as it is of many on many matters which are controversial, the court will rule one way or the other. Or the other, the court cannot rule, and and I mean the court cannot be in the middle. The mm. court must rule, yeah. and one side ma must 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 be victorious mm. over the other. And often the person who is not victorious, you know, is often pained. They see a lot yes. of things, etc. Yes. And we are seeing a lot of those things. But mm. over time, all this will settle, and maybe sometime tomorrow, this same ruling will be to the benefit, benefit of the, of side, the side that is not happy to. That is yeah. the beauty of it. Yeah. You know, so, so yes, it is a ruling that has come. Very interesting, very seminal, very, uh, 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 should I say, groundbreaking mm. in, in how we see our parliamentary democracy, yeah. you know, numbers, etc. I, I, don't, I, I don't actually know whether we'll ever have a time where we'll have this, this, this split anymore anytime mm -hmm. soon. But it is there for posterity. Yeah. Once it happens again, we will go back to this and apply it. So, to some extent, or to a large extent, clarity has been brought to this aspect of things. So, it even takes pressure of the speaker. Yeah. It takes pressure of Speaker Babin. Whether he's traveling or not, people wouldn't say, okay, it's because you want our side to lose. That is why you are deliberately yeah. traveling. Now, that pressure of him is gone. Joe Sewusu or the deputy, uh, second deputy, uh, a member from Formina, can vote. And so, it takes nothing away from the, the core membership of parliament. Yeah. I, I've also heard about another practical difficulty that some have said. That, for example, if uh, the speaker is not in town and maybe one of the deputies too is not in town, yeah. what then happens if one is presiding, he vacates the seat, who comes to sit there? I think the constitution has a cure for that. The constitution says that the, a deputy speaker yeah. or a member yeah. shall preside. Yeah. So in the case where there is just one deputy speaker yeah. available amongst the three speakers. I think parliament amongst themselves can agree that on this day, there is just one deputy speaker. In his absence, this member shall preside. Okay. So that in cases where that speaker or deputy speaker wants to vote, he calls that member to take the seat of speaker. He goes to vote, he joins the rest of the people, or he goes to vote and then he comes back to his seat and the other member goes to sit down. So that is how I think the Constitution has dealt today. Mm. You know, no doubt, very interesting decision. You may call it controversial. But in the end, 
I mean, I think it's more of a landmark decision. Really, it is because, very grand because we've been here before, mm -hmm. where we have 137, 137 yes. Parliament. It has occasioned this, you know, back and forth. We're still talking mm -hmm. in living matters. We can't vote and all of those things. Now the issue of the deputy speakers has come up. Is before, I, I I think it's going to be very interesting still because now everybody will probably want to be courting. Um, the the vote um, or, or, or or the or the preference of the Fomina um, MP, yeah. Because but, but I think we, we've seen quite a bit of that in, yeah. in the in the in the past few mm. weeks. Mm. Uh, I mean, wouldn't from, it, wouldn't from it, wouldn't the, wouldn't from the that MP also? No, no. I mean, the, the from now MP is clear. He's doing mm. business with the yeah. executive. I mean, with the, with the ruling side. party. Okay. okay, that's the MPP. Okay. And he said many times that he is MPP. If the MPP didn't want him. Yeah. He was going into the election to win for the MPP. Yeah. So that he's made his mind clear. It's MPP yeah. true blue. That, you that know what's clear. happening in his constituency. Yeah, exactly. The point. That's that we're beginning to see signs of yeah. things to come. Yeah. So, for example, I think in the minds of a lot of the people in leadership of the MPP, MPP wouldn't want to fill the candidate in Formina. Mm. I don't know what the behind the scenes, horse trading, etc., was yeah. before he finally joined them to do business. I don't know. Mm. But I think one of the things that will come up would be shielding him from MPP mm. contest. Okay. Because it appears that, I mean, not always the case, but it appears that if MPP is to fill the candidate in Formula, he may or may not lose. He may or may not win. And you don't want to put a person who has been so helpful to you yeah, in, in that, that situation. Kind of situation. And he remains an independent candidate. Yeah. So for him yeah. to move from independent level or, or, or ticket to the MPP ticket, he has to lose his seat again. Yes. Maybe it can be orchestrated such that he will lose his seat for a few months, return to the MPP ticket and vote. But again, I'm sure he'll be constrained by a few constitutional provisions because mm. I'm not sure you can just, you know, cross carpet and contest mm. on the ticket of a party because there are requirements. Maybe you have to serve a number of years in the party. You have to do a few other things before you can earn the right to contest on the ticket of the party. So, so it, it will be quite interesting the, the, the next few days. Yeah. So, um, Kweku, yeah. I, I think that this has also taken pressure off the, the parties. Mm. Because where you have such closeness in numbers, you are not afraid to put up a member to be a deputy yeah. speaker. Yeah. Because we're getting to a point where, because of the closeness of numbers, mm. if I put up a candidate and that will mean that I lose... And that candidate will not be able to vote. Yeah. That candidate will not be able to help or, um, when it comes to quorum. Mm. Then there's an issue. Yeah. So the parties are also now clear. It's no one say, okay, we are not ready to put up. So you put up a candidate so yeah. that you lose numbers. Yeah. Because mm. determination of minority majority. So I think that this decision, seminal, the landmark, yeah. groundbreaking. But I think that this goes a long way to, to improve order. And, and our parliamentary democracy. We are all waiting with bated breath for, <laughs> for the reasons, but I, I yeah. think that um, this is, this is um, a right. decision in the right direction. Fantastic. Well, let's take a short break. A question of law will continue after this. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. All right, welcome back. 
uh, the Supreme Court has made another ruling again, uh, which you know is going to impact definitely on Parliament and the happenings in Parliament. And so I have another story here, again, on citynewsroom.com. I'm going to read that quickly. Supreme Court dismisses Ascent North MB's application for Article 94 interpretation. All right. So the story here says, the Supreme Court has unanimously dismissed an application filed by the embattled Ascent North MP, James Jache Quason, to quash a decision of the Court of Appeal not to refer uh, Article 94-2A to, to the Supreme Court for interpretation. A five-member panel also dismissed by a majority decision of three to two another application from Mr. Quason for a stay of appeal proceedings at the Appellate Court and for referral of Article 92, 94-2A of the 1992 Constitution to the Supreme Court for interpretation. The panel is com uh, composed of Justices Gabriel uh, Poimang uh, as President, Agnes Joji, uh, Getru Tokonu, Clemens uh, Honyuga, and Yoni Kulendi. All right, so this is um, how much of this is going to impact on you know the in the proceedings of parliament uh, what do you what, what what can we learn from well, qu quite an interesting one as well i mm. think the supreme court has been busy yeah. uh giving back-to-back -back decisions so this is the matter involving the asin north mp yes. we have to be careful because the substantive matter is still, is still in court that hasn't yeah. been fully determined because there's an appeal pending yeah so uh sometime last year the uh, uh, some gentleman in the Asim North constituency uh, went to court over the fact that uh, Mr. Jachi Kwesin uh, owed allegiance to another country mm. at the time he was filing his nominations. It, it turned out that uh, Jachi Kwesin said he had renounced. Yeah. And his explanation of the renunciation was that once he had filled the forms and submitted, it had left his control. And so as far as he was concerned, he was bent on and he had the, uh, the intention to renounce. And so yeah. that settled it for him. Yeah. And so he went ahead, filled the EC forms, went ahead, contested the election, and then won. Now, it went, the matter went to court. The court had to look at the matter. The court eventually ruled that indeed, at the time he filled the form, he owed allegiance to another state. Mm in the sense that he hadn't renounced yeah. the citizenship or the allegiance he owed to the other country before doing so for Ghana. And that, you know, uh, flies in the face of, of Ghana's laws because you do not, there are some positions you can't hold mm. if you hold a dual citizenship or if you hold, if you owe allegiance to another country other yeah. than Ghana. Yeah. So that is the crux of the matter. Okay. So as would be expected, he quickly filed an appeal challenging the decision of the High Court. And of course, an appeal does not operate as a state of execution. Mm. You can file an appeal, but the judgment of the court below will still be effective and can be executed against you. Okay. But so what you have to do is to file what we call state of execution. Once you file the appeal, you can file a state of execution. Yeah. What the state of execution will do is that it will hold everybody else from, you know, affecting the decision of the court below against yeah. you. So it keeps the status quo. That is why he's still in parliament. Because uh, if the appeal, or if the state of execution hadn't been filed, the judgment would have operated against him. So he couldn't have been in parliament because okay. the court had declared that election null and void. Because the, 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 the person which, who contested the election in the view of the court was not properly qualified mm. and so that election was not involved all right so that appeal is, is still pending the state of the state application is such that once you file the stay it holds everything you know the, the, in the case of uh, interlocutory injunctions mm. there's a school of thought two schools of thought one says once you file it it it, it stops everything the other says no 
when you file it, you can still go ahead and do what you are doing. In the case of stay, I think at least generally, it's accepted that mm. once you file it, it holds the, 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 the situation, the status quo remains. Okay. Now, the Court of Appeal will have to determine that stay application. Now, in determining that, the MP's lawyers quickly came up, or the MP quickly came up and said, the matter for determination was in respect of Article 94-2A. 94-2A yeah. reads, a person shall not be qualified to be a member of parliament if he, A, owes allegiance to a country other than Ghana. Okay. So that is the point that the MP says requires constitutional interpretation. Mm. And by law, once an issue of interpretation of the constitution comes up, everything else must, must, must stay. The matter is transferred or remitted to the Supreme Court because okay. it is only the Supreme Court that has what we call the original jurisdiction mm. in matters like this to okay. interpret the constitution. Okay. So now we go to the Supreme Court. Of course, the, 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 the Court of Appeal disagreed with that, declined that application. The Supreme Court now, sitting on the matter, dismissed it and said, no, it is not a matter that we have to look at. Yeah. And there are various rules regarding interpretation of, of various provisions of the Constitution. Okay. One of such guidelines is that the matter must be ambiguous. So if the provision is ambiguous mm. or there's likely to be two or more interpretations put on it, which will create or bring about confusion in the minds of people, then yes, that matter will be qualified okay. for constitutional interpretation. Mm. I've not read the full decision yeah. because it's not yet out. No, that's fine. I think that the Supreme Court would have said somewhere that the matter, the, the provision in question was not ambiguous. It was clear. Mm. And so there was no need for this to be given their attention. Mm. And so it dismissed it. And I think it was a... a, a, a I, I think it was a 3-2 decision. 3-2 yes. decision. Yeah. And so what it means is that the high court decision would now stand. Chachu is a lawyer for uh, the embattled MP. And knowing the operations of Chachu, I think that he will go for a review on this. this. Yeah. And it's interesting. It's a 3-2 decision, yeah. which makes it very fertile yes. for review. Yes. Review means that two extra judges yes. will be added to the panel yeah. to be seven because there were five mm -hmm. ruling three, two. Yeah. Two extra judges will be put on it yeah. to see if they will be swayed by the argument of the parties and to what direction. Mm. And those two can overturn or can change things yeah. for the MP. I, I, yeah, I find it interesting, the, the, the whole issue of um, re-empaneling the Supreme Court by, you know, by two to judges. How long can this go on for? How many judges do we have at the Supreme Court? No, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. so, so, so the review just No, because one. you see, we've seen this before, mm -hmm. during the election yes. petition, yes. where we, um, we had five, then we went to seven, then we went to nine, you know. No, no, no not exactly. So if you have the, the panel, maybe yeah. the panel for the, the substantive matter mm. is five. Yeah, okay. five judges. Okay. It's five, okay. maybe. If there's a review, okay. Arising from a decision of that five, mm. two extra judges will have to be added. added. Okay. If there were nine judges and there's a matter arising mm. from the decision of those nine, two extra will be added. If there were seven, two extra. List, I mean, hearing the substantive matter mm. and there's a matter arising therefrom, two extra judges will be added. So at every time, it is just plus two. It's not okay. as if you'll be adding, 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 adding. No, so. so do we not see a case where there was a plus two and then it came back and did another plus two? So what happened was, mm -hmm. yes. there was because I remember there that. was a decision. Okay. There was an, an interlocutory decision. Okay. Uh, so that's the election petition you're talking yes, about. Yes, so, yes, so, yes. so the NDC yes. and their lead lawyer, Chachu, yes. disagreed with one of those decisions. Okay. Actually disagreed with all the decisions. Okay. And for all the decisions, he went on review. You know, and so the, I think it was a panel of seven. Seven, yes. So originally. It was seven. So, Two extra judges were added okay. to determine that matter. Oh. So after that matter was determined, determined. The, two the two will go back. Okay. Yes. On another matter, two judges mm -hmm. will be added. They, they, okay. they do not have to be the same two. Okay. Just any two okay. randomly will be added. Okay. 
after that matter is determined, that review is determined, it goes back to the original okay. number of judges and paneled for that particular mm. matter. That is how it works. Okay. Let me... No, I mean, quickly, the, the, the closeness of the, of the, of the decision, the 3-2, will mean that definitely mm. any lawyer and the, the kind of effect this ruling will have on the numbers in parliament, yeah. any lawyer will want to go for a review. A 3-2 um, decision is very close, and you will want to have an expanded panel of seven, mm. And a review is for 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 for, for this purpose is not to a rehearing of your matter. It's okay. To say that okay. the the three two decision was arrived at because the panel did not avert their minds mm -hmm. to one or two things, one or two things yeah. in your original yeah. um, application, application before them. So it's not it's not um, a rehearing of the matter. So I I think that a review will be filed in in no time. And, and, and then we'll have um, a decision of the seven to see where, 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 mm. where we sit. But this will obviously, however it goes, affect numbers in parliament. Mm. This will, I mean, now with the earlier decision on what a deputy speaker can do and mm. cannot do, mm. their rights to vote and yeah. all that, the, this decision and its effect I mean, slightly watered down also, mm. but very key in determining numbers uh, in Parliament. So I will, I, I would think that a, a, a review will, will mm. be filed anytime soon on this mm. matter. So, so, so practically, yeah. I mean, the two question is an NDC MP, yeah. or I don't even know what I'm saying, it's an NDC MP or what's an NDC MP, but it's an NDC MP yeah. because uh, there's was, an the high court <laughs> <laughs> So what it will mean is that NDC's number will have to drop by one. Right. Okay. So the 137 one will become 136. Mm. The majority, originally 137 yeah. plus one formula or one independent, mm. 138. Yeah. So it now puts it originally mm -hmm. at 138, yeah. 136. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now there are some issues. Ajoa Safo yes. and then Honorable Kom, mm -hmm. the hunter, the, the MP from Ahanta okay. and the Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs Minister. We understand here it's not well. I just have we all know it's not in town. Yeah. So that also reduces that one three eight to one three six. <laughs> that makes it very interesting. <laughs> so if it's one three six, one three six, yeah. and the vote is taking, once the vote is equal, or what yeah. we call draw draw, once the vote is a draw, <laughs> then the vote will be taken or the motion will be taken as lost. So okay. a draw okay. is as good as you know, a loss. Yeah. So yeah. that is the, the wow. kind of parliament we are playing with. So had Jechi Kwesi not suffered all these difficulties and suffering, mm. it would have been at present, because Ajah Safo is not around, yeah. the, the Minister of Chieftains is not around, it would have made NDC have an upper hand yeah. over the MPP. Perhaps that is why certain key decisions have been deferred for whatever reason mm. of course we know there are consultations going on yeah but could this also be a reason why certain key decisions like e-levy for example yeah. have been deferred mm. i mean th these are the dynamics and these are this is how things these are things are playing out interesting in interesting so that's that, that's it's definitely going to impact on the business of the house you know moving forward um the 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 state of the nation's address too um <laughs> what's happening with that and, and can we have it postponed, you know, without... Indefinitely? Without, no, indefinitely. I mean, well, this is, this is the first time we're seeing in our history that it's, it's, it's delayed mm. for, this much, yeah. for, for, for this long year. And there's a requirement in law for it. Mm. The Constitution provides for it in Article 67. Okay. It says it, yeah. the president mm. shall, so it's mandatory, at the beginning of each session and that's the problem it says at the beginning of each session of parliament okay so where is the beginning is the beginning the first month the mm. first quarter okay when we say beginning yeah because there is and if you read the provision as a whole in 67 because it says at the beginning of each session of parliament mm. and before a dissolution of parliament okay 
Meaning, there is a time that there's a sense of time yeah. within which you should do it, not too close to the dissolution because yeah. you must do one before the dissolution. Okay. So there must be one at the beginning. But at the beginning, what time? Okay. First month, first quarter. So maybe very soon someone will be knocking again mm. on the doors of, of the, the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court to interpret the <laughs> beginning to mean yeah. the first month or the first quarter. Because yeah. here, it doesn't give us, it just gives us a time to do it mm. in the beginning and then before a dissolution. Yeah. So it can be the morning of the of dissolution. The dissolution and you come and give the address. You can give us the state of the nation the morning of the dissolution and then give another one in the evening before the dissolution. So th the issue is, 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 is not clear here. But yeah. obviously, it is a constitutional injunction. It has mm. to be performed. But we need to... And these are some of the things that I will expect, for instance, that our standing orders will give us clarity on it. That when we say beginning of a session, mm. all things being equal, maybe the first quarter of that session, okay. this is done. Because we've read the budget, mm -hmm. appropriation is um, passed, mm -hmm. we've, we've done all these things. Yeah. So the next thing is for the, the head of state to tell mm. us where we stand and his vision yeah. for the year. So we, we, we need to get right, but it's, it's vague in the constitution when it says the beginning of each session. So... so, um, so <laughs> So I think the, the State of the Nation we was supposed to have had this about two weeks ago. Is it last week or two weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, then last we, we heard it's been postponed indefinitely. Mm. No reason was given. At the appropriate time, the president will come and deliver it. Uh, yes, no reason was given. The president is not enjoined by law to give you a reason. And indefinitely doesn't mean forever or, or a very long time. Okay. It could be tomorrow. Just that a date it's hasn't been fixed yet. Yes. Yeah. So um, I think a, a quick you know run through the various years, at least from... Uh, uh, John Mills, a lot of the State of the Nation addresses have been done in February. Okay. I think it was last year that we had it somewhere in March. I don't know if it was because of the pandemic. I, I don't know. But mm. uh, we, we had that in 2021 now, so sometime in March. So uh, it is not very, very unusual that it delays this much. Perhaps there's a lot of anxiety and quite some expectation yeah these days when you mention parliament and when president <laughs> will have to be there maybe the president want to ensure that one or two things are in place before yeah. he makes that grand entry to, mm. to see whatever he has to say etc and now that speaker we understand is not around i wonder how that is also going to play out of course mm. the speaker properly so called must not necessarily be around to make the president deliver the a message on the state of the nation but by convention, mm. the speakers been, have always been, been around. There, yeah. And now that we understand that Speaker Babu will not be around till maybe late March, I don't know how that is going to look or that mm. is going to play out. But that is the reality of the times. So I should think that in the next few days or few weeks, yeah. not weeks, in the next few days, we should have a message from the presidency telling us that on this day, or a message from the, the business committee of parliament, telling us that on this day the president will come deliver the State of the Nation yeah. address. I mean, it is a constitutional imperative. <laughs> it is something he has to do. Yeah. He shall, yeah. at the yeah. beginning of every session, mm. or each session, deliver a message on the state of the nation. Yeah. The second part is about dissolution of parliament. But the session has begun. We are about two months or so into the session. Yeah. What is the meaning or definition for beginning? Yeah. <laughs> Like Clement yeah, was no, saying. I, exactly. Because I was about what is to the ask beginning? You, I was about to ask that. You know, but I, I also the beginning is an English word. I also assume we understand that what beginning it, it, is, it must be reasonable. But then it's in Parliament. So maybe reasonable. Yeah. So beginning will be a reasonable time. Mm. A reasonable time could mean any time perhaps between <laughs> January. I, I At least the first very, quarter. The first quarter mustn't pass. It's too ambiguous. We do need the first quarter mustn't pass. Clarity. But of course, it will also be difficult to say that on this day or by this day do it. Or maybe by the first Can quarter. Go? In in the constitution, we mm. had a specific day mm. on which the budget should be read. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. But this year we couldn't yes. we couldn't meet that requirement. Okay. So even where we have dates, yeah. fixed dates, we are we are unable to. So I think that this we, we need we need we need to have some rules mm. on when we say state of the nation. Yeah. Is it the first hundred days? There should be something <laughs> within this time frame. So instead of even fixing a date, you say within 
-hmm. and then you give yourself mm -hmm. a period. Yes. So okay. within, within the first, the first quarter. quarter. Yeah. That is clear. Yeah. Or within so the first hundred days. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, okay. from the beginning I mean, of the a session. Sense, then you know. you can... And it will be interesting yeah. to know what is actually holding this back. Mm. Because the president has been around doing quite a few things. He's, yeah. in, he's in Dubai now, yeah. in the expo. Yeah. Uh, he was around doing a few other things. Uh, it's been interesting because this is so crucial. We need yeah. to know what your plans are for the year, even though a lot of that has been captured in the budget. But we need to know what your view is in respect of the year for mm. us. Mm you know, foreign relations, security, you know, etc. All right. But let, let's see how it goes. Okay, fantastic. Well, we're going to take a short break and uh, we'll come back with the docket. We're going away. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back, and it's time for the docket. Now, the, today on the docket, very interesting. The docket is the segment where we take your issues, your challenges, your stories, which you can send to us on the number 0550585832. We take those issues and then, you know, try and seek some legal education on this. And today's docket says, My father bought two plots of land for myself and my siblings. He didn't specifically give anyone the title to the land. He just said the land was for his children. The land has been there all these years and no one has bothered to develop it. When I got a bit of money, I decided to build on the land with the thought that I held part ownership of it. I moved in when the building was complete, but my older brother wasn't too happy about this and took me to court. His issue was that I had built on family property without proper permission. Also, the other charge was that since I had built on one whole plot, how was I expecting the rest of my siblings to share the land that was left? I also got very upset about this development because no one had said anything uh, when I started digging the foundation. I didn't want any further strain with my older brother and other siblings, so I decided to move out of the house altogether. Some weeks after that i heard my older brother who took the matter to court had moved to occupy the house i built with my money i'm in a bit of a shock at this sudden development and processing it has been giving me sleepless nights mind you my father has refused to discuss this matter and left us to our own fate can i counter sue him for this action how can the law help me hmm. gentlemen it's very interesting mm. um, family land mm -hmm. family property <laughs> i think that uh, i will i will touch on two um, types of holdings okay when when it comes to jointly owning mm -hmm. particularly land mm -hmm. yeah either what we call joint tenants meaning that you own it jointly and that when one person dies the ownership passes to the other mm. until the last surviving person yeah and and then we have what we call tenants in common here you have equal rights and equal access to the property mm. and you can pass your interest to your heirs and your Mr. descendants King. and yeah. stuff kings. Mm. So when it's family property and it's not clearly 
delineated and you hold it as a group, what needs to be determined is whether or not you're tenants in common or your joint tenants, because it has if, its effect. Um, in cases where people are joint tenants, what comes out is that there's a belief that people will try and do things to others to die so that they become, they the, become sole the sole owners. owners. But tenants mm. in common, on the other hand, means that you have equal share. Okay. It is undivided by half equal share. In this our problem, it's only two plots. Yeah. So it means that if you are four, technically you have it has to do two, two, two yeah. or you all come together mm. and decide to put up a structure yeah. where you will either occupy it yourselves mm -hmm. or give it out and then the proceeds thereof will then be split equally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's well that's what my my god brothers and sisters <laughs> they will still instead of but you you need to take a decision mm. because it is not in your sole name you don't have sole rights over mm. the property you share mm. the interest uh, and with others now that the brother has gone in to occupy yeah. it yeah it's his building but it's not it is on joint land yeah so he has rights to the building, mm. but does not have not rights to, to the land. land. The uh, issues uh, uh, in there that we, we, we can look at is, is his elder brother supposed to pay rent? And doesn't the same scenario present itself? That you, elder brother, you've moved into the house. Yeah. What happens to the rest of us? Yeah. So I think that the solution here um, in this matter, land not looking not enough to be shared among them. I mm. think that the best approach is to decide to put... To put up a structure or decide that to rent that structure and then share the proceeds amongst um, um, amongst them that's mm -hmm. my my view on this but this maybe in future we'll look into detail this issues of joint tenancy yeah, and tenancy in yeah. common and okay. see and see the effects there okay. yeah. very, very interesting uh, 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 scenario yeah um the father himself in the center of it all is mm -hmm. quiet uh, when I heard it at first, I thought the father had passed. Yes, that's so, what I also thought. So I started issue. looking at yeah. other things, you know. So uh, we're not sure if it was a gift properly so called. Because he said, the, 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 the person said the father bought the land and said it was for his children mm. without more. So I'm not even sure if it was a gift, what we call gift interviews, because it's not been gifted. Okay. Uh, uh, gifting somebody something in law requires certain things to be done. That hasn't been done. So okay. the property still remains in the name of the father. Of the father. So it's the yeah. father's property. Okay. Uh, they are, but he said it's for the kids. And once it's for the kids, it assumes the form of family property. So I, I would be interested to know what exactly his brother went to court for mm -hmm. because it is not in doubt that it is family property. You know, and, and in family property, anything you do on the property is family property. Mm -hmm. At at most or at best, you can only have a life interest in the property. Yeah. You cannot bequeath family property to your descendants, to your mm. children, etc. So uh, it's interesting to know what reliefs the brother went to court to seek. Well, well I mean, it, what, it does say here, though, that um, uh, his issue was that I had built on family property without proper permission, number one. And number two, that I had taken one whole plot. That was meant for a number of siblings. So, so he was, what was he plots. asking the court to do then? Okay. What was so he we, asking okay. the court to do? Okay. So the so court we, to give an order to pull down the building? Mm. To, what, what, does, what does he want the court to do? Okay. So that, that's a relief. So okay. It would be interesting to know what he wanted. Okay. And it appears the matter is still pending mm. because he's asking, she's asking if he could counter sue him. Yes. You know, so you have moved out of the house mm. and now he has now gone into the house. Yeah. I think there a could house be, that he did not build. Yes, and I think no yes, I think there could be a way of <laughs> restraining him yeah. from occupying the, the house. Okay. There could be a way also if they could agree mm. that maybe she will have life interest because that's a property. Mm. After she dies, the whole building becomes the property yeah. of the family okay. and, and, and things like that. Like Clement says, they, they can agree to sell it mm. or, or rent it, but because she built it, yeah. I mean her share of the proceeds mm. should be more because she had invested some money. It's interesting the father is not talking. He, I think he, he, he must <laughs> make a Yeah, but the quick point is that if you use your personal funds that's your own, to that's improve your, family property, yeah, it's, it's your it, private funds. Yes. Okay. 
Oh, you wow. have, oh it's a private firm. You, oh, wow. it is your, it's family property, property and you're using your, yeah. mm. your personal funds mm. to improve it. So some, mostly when you, when you walk around um, neighborhoods and you see buildings lying in disuse, but it's family property okay. and no one is interested in so you're, taking you're getting it in there. because of issues. Once yeah, issues, you, issues you like do it and it's now tenantable, you see people coming up. You know, with a lot of interesting issues here. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's take a look at our legal trivia for today. Legal trivia. Do you know that whoever unlawfully exposes a child to danger or abandons a child under 12 years or exposes any physically or mentally handicapped child to danger or abandons a physically or mentally handicapped child in such a manner as to cause any harm to the child shall be guilty of a misdemeanor? This can be found in Section 71.1 of the Criminal and Other Offences Act, Act 29. That will be all for our legal trivia today. Well, thank you very much for watching another episode of uh, A Question of Law. Of course, it's Heritage Month, so we are still here doing all things Heritage Ghana as well. It's Heritage Month on City as well. So I want to say a big thank you to my guest in studio today, uh, to Clement Kujo Akapam, uh, who is a senior law lecturer at the Faculty of Law. A freshly, freshly minted author. <laughs> well, yes, and, and, well, yes, and that too, a freshly minted author, oh, no. as well as uh, Salam Adonu, uh, who is a private legal practitioner. Keep watching City TV, a lot more interesting programming coming up. Mm -hmm.